Theistic evolution critique, universal common descent critique. We've been looking at the book Theistic Evolution, a scientific, philosophical, and theological critique. And uh, that is the cover. Uh, there are several ways you can divide the question of um, what, ha how did life get here? There is young life creation. There is old earth, which is really old life creation. Um, but I leave the traditional terminology in place. There is intelligent design theistic evolution. It happened in an evolutionary way, but God guided the process. There and and you can tell, there is non-ID theistic evolution. Maybe God guided the process, but if He did, is He didn't get His fingerprints on it, so you can't tell. And finally, there is atheistic evolution. And uh, this book is not attacking atheistic evolution, although it does so kind of sideways. It's actually attacking attacking non-intelligent design theistic evolution. And its major major complaint will be that uh, uh, non-ID theistic evolution has to look like atheistic evolution and atheistic evolution is not credible. So why are we doing this? And you'll find this in the last sentence of the last paragraph of this particular chapter. The chapter we're going to look at is written by Casey Luskin, one of two that he wrote. Um, it'll be interesting when we get to the other one if you can remember this one uh, because they form a part of the same scheme. And um, this is in part one of the book, which is a scientific critique. And it's part, section two of part one, which is the case against universal common descent and for a unique human origin. Uh, they're not yet. In two weeks, we'll be attacking the, or they'll be attacking the, uh, uh, the case for uh, common descent of humans and chimpanzees. But right now, they're talking about the general, uh, the general case, and this one is entitled "Universal Common Descent: A Comprehensive Critique." Although, as we will see in the chapter itself, it's not really comprehensive. That would require a whole book on its own, maybe a volume, several volume series. But here's the summary. Some theistic evolutionists will occasionally acknowledge problems with the mechanism of mutation and natural selection. But almost all theistic evolutionists claim that the historical part of Darwinian theory, universal common descent, is beyond dispute. Since Darwin's time, the theory of universal common descent has rested upon a number of independent lines of evidence and argument, biogeography, fossils, anatomical homology, uh, homology, homology and ev embryological similarity. In recent decades, molecular homology has been added to that list. This chapter will show that each of these separate lines of evidence is equivocal at best and that instead, Many new lines of evidence cast serious doubt upon the supposed congruence of these lines of evidence, challenging the case for universal common descent. Now, we get into the first part, and you will start seeing double here. Some theistic evolutionists will occasionally acknowledge, wait a minute, we just read that. Uh, well, the part we didn't read is, or at least will decline to de defend its creative power. Um, and then skipping on, prominent theistic evolutionists treat universal common descent as almost an axiom of all biological science and ridicule skeptics through comparisons to geocentrics, geocentrists or flat earthers. Um, and then the rest of that, you just read that. I suspect what happened was that they required a summary of each chapter and he actually had the summary already in his book, and so he just uh, uh, shortened it a little bit and put it in. Anyway, as other chapters have discussed, theistic evolution essentially takes a fully materialistic evolutionary view of biologic biological history and says, by the way, this is how God did it. 
But the term evolution can have different meanings, some of which are controversial and some of which are not. For many, evolution simply means change over time. Both theistic evolutionists and Darwin skeptics affirm that this definition of evolution is uncontroversial and correct. Um, a second definition, we've seen this before, is universal common ancestry. The hypothesis that all li living organisms are genetically related through descent with modification. Under this view, not only are all living humans related to one another, but we also share a common ancestor with apes, and going back further, we're related to everything from horses to tuna fish to broccoli to foot fungus and bacteria. This definition of evolution is, so, is controversial among many, although not all, Darwin skeptics, Michael Behe being an exception, and is increasingly controversial among evolutionary biologists. The third definition of evolution claims that natural selection acting upon random mutation was a driving mechanism behind the history of life. This definition is the most controversial among scientists, both inside and outside of evolutionary community, and it holds that the mechanisms producing change over time, definition one, and common ancestry, definition two, were apparently blind and undirected. Other chapters in section one, part one of this book, have amply addressed the inadequacy of evolution's mechanism, the third definition. The purpose of this chapter is to examine only the second definition, universal common ancestry. At first glance, common ancestry may not seem crucial to addressing theistic evolution, after all. The third definition is the one that addresses whether the history of life was unguided, a central question in the debate over theistic evolution. Moreover, common ancestry is compatible with intelligent design. For example, one possible way to view intelligent design is that God actively guided the history of life, but did so in a manner such that organisms share common ancestry. Such a view supports both intelligent design and common ancestry, yet avoids many of the logical, philosophical, and scientific difficulties that theistic evolution encounters when claiming that the entire history of life appears unguided, even though it really wasn't. Nonetheless, for a variety of reasons, common ancestry is an important part of this conversation. First, the pursuit of truth is of the utmost importance. If universal common ancestry is true, we should want to know about that. If it isn't, we should modify our views accordingly. And certainly we should want to know about that too. Second, theistic evolutionists devote much energy to arguing for common ancestry. They often mistakenly cite evidence for common ancestry as evidence for the full-blown Darwinian story and apparently naturalistic history of life, conflating the second and third definitions of evolution. While this rhetorical strategy is logically flawed, evidence for common ancestry is not necessarily evidence for blind natural selection, if the evidence for universal common ancestry is weak, then their argument faces not just a logical problem, but also a factual one. Moreover, in practice, common ancestry sometimes, although not always, actually quite a bit, serves as a gateway belief taking people away from an intelligent design-based view to a full-throated theistic evolutionary view, and for some, then on to an atheistic view, uh, Howard Van Til being one. Uh, the importance of common ancestry to this conversation is seen in that theistic evolutionists commonly argue for their view, not by citing evidence for natural selection, but rather by focusing on the evidence for common ancestry. And they often do so using the strongest of language. Finally, once the mechanism of evolution defi definition three comes under scrutiny and life's history no longer appears unguided, then evolutionary scientists lose an important rationale for claiming that all life is genetically related. If life evolved through an apparently unguided process like natural selection, then it falls that all life must be related because it's too hard to get the origin of life twice. But if all life is not related, this challenges standard neo-Darwinian accounts of biological history. Thus, an imp another important reason to discuss common ancestry is that if life is not universally related, this undercuts a core problematic the tenant of theistic evolution. For these reasons, it is appropriate to, uh, to devote some space to scientifically examining con common ancestry. Most of the other chapters in this section of the book will focus on specific claims of human ape common ancestry. 
This chapter, however, will focus more broadly on universal common ancestry, the idea that all living organisms are related. Theistic evolution is strongly endorsed common ancestry. That's point one. The importance of common ancestry to theistic evolution is witnessed in the extremely strong language that theistic evolutionists use when defending the concept. Francis Collins argues in The Language of God that the conclusion of a common ancestor for humans and mice is virtually inescapable. In Coming to Peace with Science, biologist and former biologist President Daryl Falk writes regarding mammals that virtually all geneticists are convinced they share common ancestors. Um, I find it interesting uh, argument uh, from authority. Uh, another frequent biologist author, Dennis Venema, says something in the same line. I'm not going to give you the, all of the list. If you want that, read the book. Robert Asher not only says that it's obvious, but charges that creationists are incapable of a fair, honest evaluation of the data regarding common ancestry. So not only is it true, but you guys don't know what you're talking about. Um, Francis Collins and physicist Carl Giberson uh, compare those who doubt common ancestry to geocentrists, writing, virtually all geneticists consider that the evidence proves common ancestry with a level of certainty comparable to the evidence that the Earth goes around the sun. Carl Giberson goes on to say, uh, it's like that the Earth is round. Proponents of universal common ancestry may distastefully aim to use ridicule to bully skeptics into submission. I wonder if that was used on them when they were young. But, uh, but that in itself doesn't mean common descent is therefore wrong. Despite uh, the outlandish rhetoric, the evidence is worth carefully considering. Before we investigate the evidence, it's important to note that it is theoretically possible that common ancestry might be true or false at multiple levels of the taxonomic hierarchy. For example, universal common ancestry hypothesizes that all living organisms are related. Thus, universal common ancestry might be false, but common ancestry could still be true at lower taxonomic levels, such as among all animals or all vertebrates, all mammals or all primates, etc. In fact, most of us accept that all humans share a common ancestor. In fact, virtually all of us do. Evaluating the case for common ancestry among every single high and low taxonomic grouping is far beyond the scope of this chapter and probably would entail an impossibly lengthy inquiry. So we're not going to be comprehensive after all. But that's why I entitled it UCD Critique instead of Comprehensive UCD Critique. Um, this chapter will thus evaluate the case for universal common ancestry as it is commonly ad advocated in textbooks and in popular books by theistic evolutionists and evolution advocates. And where you see green ellipses, I'm leaving stuff out. The case for universal common ancestry is often said to be cumulative based on multiple lines of evidence, including biogeography, fossils, DNA, and anatomical sim similarities, and embryology. This chapter will examine whether the evidence supports common ancestry in those different areas, starting with biogeography. So, biogeography. Does the evidence support common ancestry? Biogeography is the study of the distribution of organisms in both time and space over the history of the Earth. Defenders of neo-Darwinism commonly contend that biogeography strongly supports their viewpoint. For example, the National Center for Science Education, and you can just imagine what they say. If you want the quote, it's in the book. Uh, much biogeographical data, however, has little to do with Darwinian evolution and does not provide special evidence for common ancestry. It can be easily explained as a result of migration and continental drift, two conventional ideas accepted by virtually everyone in this debate. However, the NCSE's arguments ignores that many biogeographical puzzles that have vexed evolutionary biologists are uh, that... Yes, because they show a marked discontinuity between um, between biogeography and common ancestry. It, they ignore those things. Uh, evolutionary explanations of biogeography fail when terrestrial or freshwater organisms appear in a location such as an isolated island or continent. 
at which no standard migratory mechanism can explain how those species arrived from their proposed evolutionary ancestors. In other words, take any two populations of organisms and theistic evolution claims that if we go back far enough, they must be linked in space and time by common descent. But sometimes it is virtually impossible to explain how two particular populations arrived at their current ge geographical locations from some common ancestral population. For example, a severe biogeographical puzzle for the common ancestry, uh, for common ancestry, is the origin of South American monkeys called platyrines. That's flat noses in Greek. Based on the molecular and morphological evidence, New World platyrine monkeys are thought to be descended from African Old World or catarine, that's noses down, monkeys. Uh, the fossil record shows that monkeys have lived in South America for about 30 million years. But plate tectonics shows that Africa and South America separated about 100 to 120 million years ago, and South America was an isolated island continent from about 80 to 3.5 million years ago. In other words, they couldn't have come from North America. So... If South American monkeys split from African monkeys around 30 million years ago, neo-Darwinism must somehow explain how monkeys cross hundreds, if not thousands, of kilometers of open ocean to end up in South America. This poses a major problem for common ancestry, one recognized by multiple experts. A HarperCollins textbook on human evolution states the origin of platyrin monkeys puzzled paleontologists for decades. When and how did the monkeys get to South America? Primatologists John Flegel and Christopher Gilbert explain, the most biogeographically challenging aspects of platyrin evolution concerns the origin of the entire clade. South America was an island continent through most of the tertiary, 66 to 2.5 million years ago, conventional dates, and uh, paleontologists have debated for much of this century how and where primates reached South America. For those unfamiliar with the explanations of, the evolution, of evolutionary scientists, their responses to such puzzles can almost be too incredible to believe. They propose not that common descent might be wrong, but that monkeys must have rafted across the Atlantic Ocean from Africa to South America to colonize the New World. The HarperCollins textbook explains the rafting hypothesis argues that monkeys evolved from prosimians once and only once in Africa and made the waterlogged trip to South America. Flegel and Gilbert admit that the rafting hypothesis raises a difficult biogeographical issue because South America is separated from Africa by a distance of at least 2,600 kilometers, that's about 1,600 miles, making a Phylogenetic and biogeographic link between the primate faunas of the two continents seem unlikely, I guess. Uh, unwilling to consider non-evolutionary options, they conclude the rafting hypothesis is the most likely scenario for the biogeographic origin of platyrines. In other words, the unlikely monkey rafting hypothesis is made likely only because they assume common descent must be true. Now, to be fair, uh, it was probably only about a thousand miles during this period of time instead of a thousand six hundred, but hey. Uh, needless to say, the rafting hypothesis itself faces serious difficulties. Mammals like monkeys have high metabolisms and require large amounts of food and water. Um, they must have stocked up the raft, I guess. Uh, Flegel and Gilbert thus concede that overwater dispersal during primate evolution seems truly amazing for a mammalian order and conclude the reasons for the prevalence of rafting during the course of primate evolution remain to be explained. This is by no means the only case where evolutionary biologists are forced to invoke rafting or other speculative mechanisms of oceanic dispersal to explain away difficult problems. Other biogeographical conundra include the presence of lizards and large caviomorphs, rodents, in South America, the arrival of bees, lemurs, and other mammals in Madagascar. I presume that they, he didn't mean that bees were mammals. Uh, the <clears throat> appearance of elephant fossils on various islands, the appearance of freshwater frogs across isolated oceanic island chains, and numerous other examples. 
This problem exists for extinct species as well. A 2007 paper in Annals of Geophysics notes the still unresolved problem of disjointed distribution of fossils on opposite coasts of the Pacific. That's really rafting. However, this paper doesn't involve rafting. Instead, it proposes something even more unlikely. Populations became separated due to an expanding Earth. And uh, Luskin notes this is a long discarded geological hypothesis. Um, a 2005 review in Trends in Ecology and Evolution explains the essence of the problem. A classic problem in biogeography is to explain why particular terrestrial and freshwater taxa have geographical distributions that are broken up by oceans. Why are, the, uh, why are southern beaches found in Australia, New Zealand, New Guinea, and southern South America? Why are there iguanas on the Fiji Islands where as all their close relatives are in the New World? But I thought biogeography proved evolution. After considering several unexpected biogeographical examples, the review continue, concludes, these cases reinforce a general message of the great evolutionist, that is Darwin, given enough time, many things that seem unlikely can happen. Uh, indeed, unlikely does appear to be the message here. If you're going to retain common ancestry, you must accept some extraordinary biogeographical claims. Who was it that said extraordinary claims required extraordinary evidence? The fossil record. And we've just been over this from the last chapter, so I won't go into too much detail, but... A popular college-level biology textbook explains fossils are the only direct record of the history of life. This seems generally correct, making the fossil record an ideal place for testing universal common ancestry. The textbook's author, geologist Donald Prothero, has elsewhere written that the fossil record is an amazing testimony to the power of evolution with documentation of transitions that Darwin could only have dreamed about. If you feel otherwise, Prothero continues, then you're a creationist who shares much in common with the neo-Nazi Jew-hating Holocaust deniers. Oh. But what do the fossils say about evolution? If all living organisms are related, as universal common ancestry predicts, then the fossil record should seemingly contain transitional forms that show the intermediate stages between life's various groups. But the history of life bears a repeated pattern of explosions, which we saw last week, where new fossil types appear abruptly without clear evolutionary precursors. Perhaps the most famous is the Cambrian explosion, and since we've been over that a few times, I'm going to skip over his evidence. If you want to read it, it's in the book. Then there's the great Ordovician biodiversification event. Regarding the origin of major fish groups, Columbia University geoscientist Arthur Streller wrote that this is one count in the creationist charge that can only evoke in unison from paleontologists a plea of nolo contender. You got us there. In unison, the major fish groups. We also see an explosive and rapid appearance of other marine organisms such as ammonites, other hard-shelled marine invertebrates, and mosasaurs. As for plants, a paper in the Annual Review of Ecology and Systematics explains that the origin of land plants is the terrestrial equivalent of the much-debated Cambrian explosion of marine faunas. Goes on to cite angiosperms. Land animals show similar patterns. The fossil record shows an explosion of tetrapods when terrestrial vertebrates appear. And then he talks about dinosaur groups. And he talks about birds. He actually uses a singular, so I had to put on the S. Um, Similarly, many authorities cite an explosion or explosive diversification of major mammal groups in the tertiary. Eldridge and some others attempted to explain many of these abrupt appearances of major fossil groups through punctuated equilibrium. As biologist Jeffrey Schwartz at the University of Pittsburgh explains, we are still in the dark about the origin of most major groups of organisms. They appear in the fossil record as Athena did from the head of Zeus full-blown and raring to go in contradiction to Darwin's depiction of evolution as resulting from the gradual accumulation of countless infinitesimally minute variations. Wow. 
Comparing those who recognize this Dar non-Darwinian pattern to Holocaust deniers won't make it go away. Molecular and morphological phylogenetic trees. Perhaps the most common argument for universal common ancestry encountered by students in college level biology textbooks is the universality of the genetic code. The claim that all life uses the same nucleotide triplets to encode the same amino acids. However, the gen genetic code is not universal. Many variants in the genetic code are known among various organisms, including within our own bodies. There's the mitochondrial code, which is different from the, not much, but some, enough to cause confusion if you're translating protein, which is different from the normal uh, nucleotide, uh, uh, nucleus uh, genetic code. Douglas Theobald tested universal common ancestry against the exceedingly unlikely hypothesis that living organisms independently involve the same biomolecules and sequences by sheer chance. Universal common ancestry appeared compelling only because it was being compared to a, pre a preposterous null hypothesis. He, he made the comparison. He said, we can prove that universal common ancestry is true, but that was because he compared it with another hypothesis that's just crazy. What about if you compare it with, com with common design? Well becomes a little more difficult to prove that uh, common design isn't the appropriate one. Indeed, contra Theobald's arguments for universal common ancestry, not all fundamental biomolecules are universal among organisms. As the author of one paper found, several core components of the bacterial DNA replication machinery are unrelated or only distantly related to the functionally equivalent components of the archaeal and eukaryotic replication apparatus leading them to suggest DNA replication likely evolved independently in the bacterial and archaic, archaeal eukaryotic lineages. But if that's the case now, we have two origins of life. And that's the reason why they don't want to just surrender to that. Evolutionary biologists often claim that patterns of similar nucleotide and amino acid sequences of genes and proteins allow organisms to be organized into a phylogenetic tree of life, showing the evolutionary relationships between all living organisms. This tree of life was Darwin's only illustration in the origin of species, and it has become the most famous icon representing his theory. Um, but does the tree of life exist? In the 1960s, soon after the genetic code was uncovered, pioneering um, scientist Linus Pauling I oh, I know what happened. I, no, ignore that evolution thing. I'm not sure where that came from. And em Emilia Zuckercandle predicted that phylogenetic trees based on biomolecules would confirm expectations of common descent already held by evolutionary biologists who studied morphology, that is, the physical traits of organisms. Hoping to validate Pauling's and Zuckercandle's prediction, Biologists began sequencing genes from all manner of living organisms. In the 1990s, this led to a discovery that confounded evolutionary biologists. Life falls into three basic domains, archaea, bacteria, and uh, the higher life forms, um, which cannot be resolved into a neat tree-like pattern. Thus, the prominent biochemist W. Ford Doolittle lamented, Molecular phylogenetics, phylogeneticist, phylogenist will have failed to find the true tree, not because their methods are inadequate or because they've chosen the wrong genes, but because the history of life cannot properly be represented as a tree. Oof. He explained that for many biologists, it is as if we have failed at the task that Darwin set for us, delineating the unique structure of the tree of life. The basic problem is one that uh, is that one gene leads to one version of the tree of life, but another gene leads to an entirely different tree. What seems to imply a closer evolutionary relationship in one case, that is two similar genes, doesn't in another. To put it another way, biological similarity is constantly appearing in places where it wasn't predicted by common descent, leading to conflicts between phylogenetic trees. 
numerous technical papers uh, make that point. There's three of them, I think, that he quotes. Perhaps the most candid admissions came in a 2009 article in New Scientist titled, Why Darwin Was Wrong About the Tree of Life. Ooh. It quoted researcher Eric Baptiste admitting that the Holy Grail was to build a tree of life. But today that project lies in tatters, torn to pieces by an onslaught of negative evidence. According to the article, many biologists now argue that the tree of concept is obsolete and needs to be discarded. The paper recounted the results of a study by Michael Sivanen, which compared 2,000 genes across six animal phyla. In theory, he should have been able to use the gene sequences to construct an evolutionary tree, showing the relationship between the six animals. He failed. The problem was that different genes told contradictory evolutionary stories. Sivanen succinctly explained the problem. We've just annihilated the tree of life. It's not a tree anymore. It's a different topology entirely. What would Darwin have made of that? Almost sounds like what would Jesus do, but... Um, clearly, mole molecule-based trees often conflict with one another. But what about Pauling and Zucker Candle's prediction that mo molecule-based phylogenetic trees should, be, should match those constructed by morphology? A review of an article in Nature entitled Bones, Molecules, or Both explained that evolutionary trees constructed by studying biological molecules don't resemble those drawn up from morphology, admitting that battles between molecules and morphology are being fought across the entire tree of life. Skipping over a, few, a couple paragraphs, in any case, these frequent discrepancies between molecular and morphology-based trees and between various molecule-based trees have led some scientists to conclude that the prediction of Zucker Candle and Pauling was fundamentally wrong. A paper in the journal Biology Theor Theory, Biological Theory explained, molecular systematics is largely based on the assumption, first clearly articulated by Zucker Candle and Pauling, that, degrees, uh, that degree of overall similarity reflects degree of relatedness. This assumption derives from interpreting molecular similarity or dissimilarity between taxa in the context of a Darwinian model of continual and gradual change. Review of the history of molecular systematics and its claims in the context of molecular biology reveal there is no basis for the molecular assumption. Ooh. Skipping over a paragraph, assumptions, epicycles, and ad hoc hypotheses. Centuries ago, when astronomers held to a geocentric model of the solar system, they would often encounter data that run directly counter to that model. Sometimes planets would appear to, be, to temporarily move backwards in a retrograde motion. Early scientists explained away the contrary data by invoking the epicycle. Uh, today, evolutionary biology f faces a similar dilemma. Biologists are constantly uncovering similarities between organisms that appear in the patterns not predicted by universal common descent. Proponents of neo-Darwinian evolution thus adopt modern-day epicycles, ad hoc hypothesis, invoked to explain why data runs counter to the tree of life hypothesis. And they're going to give some of them. First and foremost, phylogenetic trees are based on the assumption that common ancestry is true. That assumption, and it is merely an assumption, is so deeply embedded in evolutionary thinking that theorists often forget it's there. In a rare example, Elliot Sober and Michael Steele acknowledge it is a central tenet of modern evolutionary theory that all living things on Earth trace back to a single common ancestor. And this proposition is central because it is presupposed so widely in evolutionary research. They acknowledge that phylogenetic methods assume that a tree exists and the common ancestry is correct. Whether one uses cladistic parsimony, distance measures, or maximum likelihood methods, the typical question is which tree is the best one and not whether there is a tree in the first place. Skipping over a number of uh, paragraphs there, the main assumption sounds nice in theory, but in practice it fails constantly. For instance, under the main assumption, the reason you have two eyes and your dog has two eyes is that you shared a common ancestor with two eyes. Yep, that is a possibility. But cephalopods, octopi, and squid also have two eyes. 
And according to standard evolutionary wisdom, there's no reason to think your most recent common ancestor with cephalopods had two eyes. We're not even sure if it had eyes. Perhaps the defender of common ancestor replies, both organisms independently evolved two eyes just by chance. Perhaps. But human cephalopod similarities go much deeper. Cephalopods have a camera eye with a basic design that's almost identical to human eyes, except for the inverted retina. Such, surely such similarities are taken to, to indicate common ancestry, right? Wrong. There's convergent evolution is invoked where we both evolved, but why two eyes in that case? Skipping on, such extreme convergence is disconcerting to many evolutionary biologists, as Richard Dawkins acknowledges. It is vanishingly improbable that exactly the same evolutionary pathway should ever be traveled twice. Yet he admits that there are numerous examples in which independent lines of evolution appear to have converged from very different starting points and what look, like, look very like the same endpoint. Um, the marsupial fossils in, uh, uh, fauna in uh, Australia are just one example. Um, not to worry, Dawkins tells us. Rather than facing the challenge of convergent evolution, he simply declares, it is all the more striking a testimony to the power of natural selection. Yep. Beyond the fact that it is highly unlikely Extreme convergent evolution presents an even more serious problem for neo-Darwinian theory. It shows that the main assumption has failed, that biological similarity does not necessarily indicate inheritance from a common ancestor. The uh, inner ears of bats and whales comes to mind. Um, this challenges the heart of the methodology used to infer common descent. If you don't buy that premise, then the whole argument falls apart. One evolutionary systematist, Nic Nicholas Matsky, maintains that these failures of methodology pose no problem for common descent, as he notes that we can statistically analyze the congruency to, of trees to assess whether the assumptions of tree building are holding true. In response to Darwin's skeptics, he posted two phylogenetic trees, in this case, cladograms, and claimed that they demonstrated the common ancestry of arthropods. In reality, however, they demonstrated how the methods of phylogenetic reconstruction often fail to establish the assumptions that underline common ancestry. We'll go into this a little more. One statistical method of determining the extent to which a data set fits a tree-like pattern is to calculate a tree's consistency index. This is found by taking the minimum number of evolutionary events required by the overall data set and divide that by the number of events required by the tree. A high CI, closer to one, means that the, that the uh, tree explains everything, indicates that the data fits a tree-like pattern. A lower CI, close to zero, usually indicates the data is inconsistent with a tree. It means the tree explains maybe half or a quarter of, the, uh, of what you find. Consider the CIs for the arthropod trees posted by Matsky. This is the ones he's used as an example. One had a, a CI of 0 0.565. Um, uh, that should be reference 81. I missed that. That means that 43.5% of the time, a given trait or character analyzed in the data set was not distributed in a tree-like pattern, meaning the main assumption that biological similarity results from common ancestry failed. 43.5% of the time, almost a coin flip. Likewise, consider the CI of the other cladogram Matsky posted. He, he listed several other ones. If you're interested, you can read the section, um, which purports to show the relationship of various Cambrian arthropods. It has a CI of 0 0.384, which even the original authors admit was rather low. So he's using these as examples of how things fit. Perhaps the main assumption should be rewritten as biological similarities indicate inheritance from a common ancestor, except for when they don't. Is common descent testable? To be sure, plenty of trees enjoy much higher CIs. But even in those happy cases, how can we know whether the main assumption is valid given how often it fails elsewhere? 
And if the main assumption hadn't held, would that even have even mattered? Indeed, why do evolutionary biologists tolerate the frequent failure of their field's core assumptions? They tolerate it because to do otherwise would be to abandon common ancestry. A 2010 paper reported trees with CIs under 0.1, meaning in more than 90% of the data didn't fit a tree. At what point can we falsify common descent? Well, of course, the obvious answer is no, at no point. Because it's, it's a dogma, and it's not. Uh, it's no longer a hypothesis. Apparently, no pattern is necessarily inconsistent with common ancestry because you can always invoke as much convergent evolution or loss of traits as needed to force the data into a tree. And when those explanations are unlikely, other epicycles like horizontal gene transfer, which think, what's the difference between horizontal gene transfer and intelligent design reusing things twice? Um, incomplete lineage sorting or coalescence and rapid evolution, to list a few, can be invoked to explain away data that doesn't fit a tree. Indeed, modern genome sequencing, sequencing has discovered thousands of orphan genes, unique genes that exhibit no homology, sequence similarity, to any other known gene. These genes ought to refute common ancestry because they cannot be compared to genes from other species and thus do not fit any phylogenetic tree. The problem is usually ignored. Skipping over about six paragraphs and going to embryology, which we'll touch very briefly and then move on. In a letter to the American botanist Asa Gray, Charles Darwin urged that embryology was by far the strongest single class of facts in favor of his theory. Much has changed in the 150 years since Darwin penned these words, but embryology remains a favorite line of evidence cited by evolutionists to support common descent, particularly among the vertebrates. And uh, he goes on to ontogeny, recapitulates phylogeny, which is taught but not believed anymore. And uh, I'm going to just skip over about 14 paragraphs, which include the heckle embryos. Um, and go, what's left of the congruence argument for universal common ancestry? Uh, Sheena Tyler covered that, uh, that last stuff pretty uh, thoroughly. At the beginning of this chapter, we noted that the case for common descent is often said to be cumulative, based on multiple lines of evidence, including biogeography, fossils, DNA, and anatomy, and embryology. How is the theory faring? In biogeography, evolutionists resort to unlikely and speculative explanations where species must raft across vast oceans in order for common descent to account for their unexpected locations. Paleontology fails to reveal the continuous branching pattern predicted by common ancestry, and the fossil record is dominated by abrupt explosions of new life forms. Regarding molecular and morphology-based trees, conflicting phylogeny, phy, phylogenies have left the tree of life in tatters. Phylogenetic methods are reduced to predicting that shared similarity indicates common inheritance, except for where it do, when it doesn't. Similar problems confound embryology, where evolutionary biologists predict similarities will exist between vertebrate em embryos, except for where we find di differences, and it predicts those too. Well, after the fact, anyway. Um, as P.Z. Myers has shown us, common descent seems to predict whatever is expedient. If there's any clear pattern here, it's this. The data often fail to fit the predictions of universal common descent. But when that happens, proponents of common descent simply change their predictions. This raises the question of the scientific status of common descent. At best, it's a scientific theory that is contradicted by much evidence. At worst, it's not even a scientific theory that makes concrete, testable predictions. For these and many other reasons, even some mainstream evolutionary scientists are becoming increasingly skeptical of universal common ancestry and the monophyly of life. A 2009 paper in Trends in Genetics noted that breakdowns in core neo-Darwinian tenets like the traditional concept of the tree of life or that natural selection is the main driving force of evolution in indicate the modern synthesis has crumbled apparently beyond repair. A 2012 
2012 paper in Annual Review of Genetics explicitly doubted universal common ancestry, suggesting life indeed might have a multiple origins. Another paper in Biology Direct noted that the sudden emergence of new complex life forms contradicts a tree pattern. Major transitions in biological evolution show the same pattern of sudden emergence of diverse forms at a new level of complexity. The relationship between major groups within an emergent new class of biological entities are hard to decipher and do not seem to fit the tree of pattern that following Darwin's original proposal remains the dominant description of biological evolution. To be sure, these authors support some form of unguided materialistic evolution, but the precise reason that they are critiquing the classical evolutionary model is that much data contradicts universal common ancestry. 21st century biology seems to be following the evidence beyond universal common ancestry and the neo-Darwinian tree of life. Our friends in the theistic community would be wise to follow suit, or at least to tone down their rhetoric against reasonable skeptics of universal common ancestry. And that's the end of that chapter. Now, my take on this is uh, this chapter has a lot of material. I've skimmed through it. Reading it in the context of the book, it is most useful for biogeography and those trees of life. The fossil record and embryology are covered <coughs> elsewhere um, in more detail, uh, although there are a few little choice pieces that, the, that Luskin has that I think are worth looking at in the fossil record. I think Luskin is, makes a very good case that common descent is not required by the data, but rather is contradicted by some of the data. I think that the most powerful arguments in this regard are the biogeography of monkeys and iguanas in the Fiji Islands, uh, how they got from the Americas is not clear, the lack of congruence of various descent trees, and, in my opinion, the presence of orphan gene, which is a real sleeper and people have not paid much attention to it. Note that horizontal gene transfer is indistinguishable from designed horizontal gene transfer. Now, note that if one assumes common descent, then not only will one cling to that story, but that one may not even be aware of much evidence against common descent. You just it blows right by you because you're not even considering the hypothesis that it's not common descent. This makes that kind of science not self-correcting. If science is not self-correcting, then it should lose its privileged place in society. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. This is getting into a slightly different area, but very much related. Uh, you sit here and wonder why an idea like common descent would become popular and accepted without question. I think we have a, a case uh, here in uh, what's happened in politics. It is becoming commonly accepted that politics, it's no longer what is true, what is important. It's what or how are you going to argue to win. Uh, and and that the whole society is accepting this as, hey, this is, this, is, this is the norm. And it should not be the norm. You're accepting a degenerate form of information when you do this. Uh, the human mind is very plastic, and how do you guard against uh, these concepts that we, you know, that we uh, tend to adopt, uh, and they become the norm in our thinking when uh, we're going down the wrong road, and we become unaware of it. Uh, I, 
I've been thinking a little bit when you know when I was a child, authoritarianism was uh, acceptable, very acceptable. Uh, a uh, person who's in charge could say things. Now you have to have everybody has to have their part in the thing. So whole whole different game and so on uh, goes on there and so on. And we, we've seen the same thing here in. Uh, uh, this idea of common ancestry here that uh, it becomes the norm and uh, how do you how do you affect this well you this chapter gives a good example you need to show data that it doesn't work and uh, uh, turn the focus from that acceptance of the norm to the unacceptance which I think is a good chapter very good chapter Uh, one of the things that I found interesting is that you know people will um, will claim that we just need to accept science, and that universal common descent seems to be the seems to be where that coming is coming from, um, even more than the mechanism. Um, And I wonder whether these people are caught in a time warp, that they're seeing things from 40, 50 years ago, and uh, maybe even in some cases, you know, 100 years ago, and that this is what convinced them. And so therefore, it should convince us as well. And it, they just don't fathom how we could possibly be that dumb. And so therefore, well, we must be that dumb or else we're ignorant, but we, they can correct that and we're still that dumb. Or, well, we must be wicked. But I'd really not rather think, not think about that. I think that's how, if, if, if you catch when uh, Richard Dawkins says, you know, somebody doesn't believe in evolution, you know. The, universe, the, the evolution he's talking about is really, and he defined it later, uh, universal common descent. That is precisely this stuff. Mm -hmm. And... I think that it is the unwillingness of of some Christians to buck that tide that leaves them in the theistic evolution camp. You've got to get at the harder data. That that is the, that is the, uh, the only solution to this problem, as I can see, is. This. That uh, the facts and so on, and trying to rise above the uh, influence. I uh, <clears throat> a few years ago, I gave a lecture at University of California Riverside in a, a seminar. Uh, actually, the lecture was about uh, catastrophism in the Grand Canyon, and uh, but there were several professors there from the geology department and. Uh, attending, the, it was a seminar kind of lecture, I guess. Uh, after my lecture, the uh, one of the professors said, "says uh, you know, well, uh, biochemistry shows common ancestry." And I said, uh, "To me, biochemistry is the strongest evidence for creation that there is because it's so complex." We're talking about two different areas, of course. He was talking about the similarity. Now, let me just stop you there for half a second. This guy was a geologist? No, biologist. Oh, okay. Remember so he's, he's arguing for biochemistry. He's, he's a member of the National Science Foundation. Okay. Uh, he was a biologist and so on. He's a, uh, but uh, <clears throat> he and I are on two different tracks, of course. 
I was on the track of complexity. He's on the track of similarity, which this chapter trips right into, you know, that, that type of thing. But it, it tells you a little bit about uh, uh, how we, we get into these grooves and we need to uh, expand our thinking. The uh, seminar went on for two hours after that. The students asking me, and discussing the question, is there a God? Which has a little part in doing of my writing the book, Science of Discovers God. Uh, but it really hit me, hey, uh, these, these, these kids are not asking the questions that uh, we're commonly asked here, and they're really wondering about the whole picture of atheism and so on, which... Uh, affects more people in different parts of the country and the world than in other parts. It's just a lot of people, a lot of Chinese don't believe in God whatsoever. I, I, there's such a great population there that doesn't believe in God. That'd yeah. be their atheist. And, uh, and so on. Not more, but in South America, atheism's not that popular. Well, actually, I agree with you that... Uh I think the more fundamental question is, is there a God? Once we have a God, then then miracles do become possible. And then uh, there are a number of other th uh, things that can come into play at that point. Okay. If you don't have that, then, then, uh, then the argument... Uh, well, this is what allows people to be blind like this, is you see, if there is not a God then Darwin is the only game in town. So he must be right. And we just have to find enough epicycles to make our theory fit the facts. But, but a lot of people will feel comfortable jumping over that step. And I might say a lot of people uh, in our milieu right around here in, in Loma Linda jump over that step. And they, they fail to see that once you open the door for God, uh, you're in a whole different game than what the size of a community is in. And that means that although the facts of the scientific community have to be accounted for, the judgment of the scientific community does not necessarily, because they're judging things by an entirely different criteria than, than what we would. And I think that's the importance of it. And that's why I think that this is a foundational issue. If you answer the question, is there a God, can he intervene? You answer those two questions, then all of a sudden a whole bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of doors that people want you to go through are closed. And a whole bunch of doors that, that they don't want you to go through are open. And, you know... Um, how did we get platyrrhine monkeys from catarrhine monkeys? Well, if it has to be, because they couldn't have evolved from slime, that's pretty obvious, at least not directly. That's too much of a jump. Um, and so they had to come from uh, the old world monkeys so they must have rafted because how else are you going to get them there at this time period and you just you swallow that because you've got nothing else uh, that will work there's no land bridge between South America and Africa at this time um, whereas if God created them, well, one branch of monkeys migrated one way, one branch of monkeys migrated the other way, and they went to the general area of where they were before. Why is that? I don't know. Homing instinct, something? Um, but that's the kinds yeah. of questions that you might a answer from a short age chronology. I, I guess if you're an old earth creationist, God created the monkeys brand new in South America. 
or maybe he created both, and then the platyrrhine monkeys died out in the older uh, old world before they left fossils, and the catarrhine monkeys died out in the new world before they left fossils. Do you have any idea where this author lies on that issue? Um, he's he's old earth. Uh, he's old life. So, um, you know, he. I think that. I think that he would prefer to say that, that God created him. Man, that that raises a whole bunch of questions. Oh, we'll get into those questions. And that's the fun part, because this book it tries very hard to be neutral. But it isn't. We will see. Uh, yes, comment here. Since Ariel made that statement, I think I want to pursue that a little bit more. What we're seeing in uh, science, and have been seeing all these years, and billions of dollars involved in it, they're saying, uh, it, to me, lack of evidence is not the proof of its non-existence. You see? And so in the political arena, we see the exact same thing. How much money is being spent into, there has to be something in there. What happened in Chicago? I don't get to watching. I don't, only when I get on the treadmill, I, uh, elliptical machine, that's when I turn it on. What happened in Chicago is horrible. But you see, that has become the norm. Um, Jesse or something, what's his name? The guy? Smollett? Smollett? Yeah, yeah, he got it. Yeah, but you see, but the thing is, I'm talking about the trend. I think I heard it somewhere, 40% of the millenniums have an attitude, you owe it to me. Now, this is, this is, this is, this should wake up people, you see. What kind of attitude are the young people growing up with? Here and yeah. many other places of the world. So, 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 science is going one way, society is going one way. You see, and the ones who really, truly want to, hey, that said the Lord makes sense to me, are going to be the minority are, and are in trouble. Well, uh, yeah, it, in fact, it's more than that, uh, although that's a part of it. It's that, it's that there is no objective truth, and so what matters is whether you want to buy the narrative or not. And people are buying it. I mean, everyone. Yeah. It makes sense to them. Yeah, as long as it fits uh, what you're expecting, why that's what counts. Anyway, behind you there. Take charge of the narrative and you take charge of the argument. Yeah. And so that's what happens. But my uh, point was in science, in theology, in politics, the same thing is happening. And I know your book dealt with you know, how religion and science work together. And the verse in Revelation that says, let him who is, what, faithful remain faithful, let uh -huh. him who is not remain that way. I used to think that was God pronouncing, you know, that's it, it's over, no more discussion. But I'm more inclined to believe these days that what God is doing is just saying, okay, earth, you've, you're not interested in any... You go on a college campus, see if they're interested in change. You go with these uh, theistic evolutionists and see if they're interested uh, in the same thing in theology. We stake our ground and we're not going to move from it. And God just says, okay, earth, you've done it. I'm not going to change your mind. And he just acknowledges what's already happened on earth. Yeah, I agree with you. I I don't think that this is God getting tired of the whole show and just freezing it in place. I think it's God recognizing that it's already frozen in place. Right. We're not quite there yet. There are still people who are listening. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but it's moving in that direction. Do you have a comment over there? No. Okay. Well... Um, Come back next week, and uh, Paul Nelson, who, by the way, is a short, uh, young life creationist, um, will be commenting on uh, design, attacking it from a slightly different view, 
uh, he's going to ask five questions uh, that that we should be asking ourselves if we're looking at universal common descent. And then after that, we'll be going into the uh, the common ancestry of humans and chimps, which is a fascinating subject.